This is the West Virginia Capital Report. Funding for the West Virginia Capital Report is brought to you by Mark A. Hunt and Associates and by the AFL-CIO of West Virginia. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Capital Report. I'm Bill Laird along with co-host Dave Perry, and we have a great show lined up for you today. Uh, again, we come to you from the West Virginia offices of the American Federation of Teachers, the AFT, and uh, uh, have the opportunity to sit down and uh, speak with the new uh, new president of the West Virginia AFT, Mr. Fred Albert. And uh, uh, Fred, congratulations on uh, being the, uh, the newly elected uh, president of the West Virginia AFT. Uh, Certainly uh, a lot of challenges go along with that position, but uh, again, appreciate you joining us today on the Capitol Report. Thank you. It's my privilege to be here. I, it's my pleasure. Um, I'm excited about my new role. I've been uh, around for a little while. I was a classroom teacher in Kanawha County for 29 years, and uh, probably the hardest part of this job so far is leaving the classroom, but I'm excited about the future of AFT. I'm excited about our future in West Virginia, and I'm excited about what we can do for our teachers and students here in the state. Well, that's great. And uh, and again, uh, you know, uh, uh, literally, I guess uh, you're you're new to the position of president of the AFT. Certainly not to the organization itself. Right. But uh, uh, maybe you could we could just start things out a little bit by uh, kind of what your vision may be, uh, what uh, some of the things uh, you have in mind as far as uh, uh, your new leadership position with the AFT. Well, thank you. Well, I was a math teacher, uh, so math is very near and dear to my heart. I know that math uh, teachers are, um, we have a shortage of math teachers in our state, so I want to do everything that I can uh, with our teachers to promote our teaching field in math. Uh, how do we attract, how do we retain good math teachers, not only math teachers, but social studies and science teachers we need to be able to retain, to attract first, and retain good teachers in our state. But my heart is also with our students. We need healthy students in our classroom. So that's one of my campaigns, is to make sure we have healthy children that in every classroom in West Virginia. And whatever we need to do to do that, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and work to make that happen. Let's, let's talk a little bit about math and math certification and this yes. critical shortage, uh, particularly math. But as you've said, as you've indicated, and I'm glad to hear that, we've got shortages in different geographic areas all over the state in different content areas. Yes. But specifically, math seems to be the priority right now, especially with the Math for Life uh, initiative that the department's undertaken over the next five years. What kind of proposals do you feel would allow us to maintain quality and at the same time uh, create alternative programs to mass certifications. Mr. Albert? Well, professional development is critical. You know, we need to support our teachers. And I think statistics show that so many young teachers do not necessarily feel supported. But we need to make sure that they are supported in their endeavors, that we are there to provide quality professional development to help them do their jobs. And that, I believe, will be one of the avenues that we can take to provide um, or to make sure that we do retain quality teachers in our classroom for our students. And uh, just show them that we're there for them, to support them in whatever they're doing, that they're not there alone, and that we have support mechanisms in place for them. Um, to make them feel appreciated, to make them feel comfortable, and to be there for them in every way that we can. I know we've talked about various incentives to cause people to go into math, perhaps a, a uh, English teacher that will want to convert to math, or perhaps let's say just a, a uh, chemist or a, a biology teacher or biology major that would want to convert to math. What kind of uh, venues do you think could be established to see this accomplished? Well, I think that we have to show them that while content knowledge is extremely important, they also need good classroom management skills. That is uh, the selling point, and we need to support them in that regard to provide training. They may know the content, 
and they may be comfortable in all of the sciences or the physics or anything dealing with math, but to have good classroom management and be able to uh, reach the students that's where they need some alternative uh, structures or some alternative lessons that we could help provide. Through, and again, it's, it uh, basically boils down to good, sound professional development. That's key, that's critical. And of course, I know as we develop these programs and so forth, we don't want to do anything to displace any positions or opportunities for certified teachers. Right, exactly, that's critical. We, in, uh, all across the state, we hear that over and over that we have teachers in the classrooms, but they're not all certified in that field, in that particular field, and that's what we need. We need certified teachers in each discipline. And as you've indicated there, the pedagogy would be what we'd want to look at first, it seems like you're saying. Exactly. At our college level and, and any professional development that will be developed. Yes, and AFT is, we have some great programs. We have a summer school each year held up at Camp Dawson where a couple of hundred teachers come for a week full of professional development and one of the strands in that professional development is uh, managing antisocial behavior. It's uh, an AFT developed program. It's very strong in pedagogy. It's very strong in showing teachers how you deal with problems that we're all faced with today and it, it, it's got positive results. How would one access this summer school with this program or who, who is it made available to and at what cost? It's made available free of cost to the participants. They're provided a lodging, they're provided the whole week of uh, fellowship, the lessons, and it's all provided by their locals uh, through AFT. So you first have to be a member of AFT. Uh, we will probably around uh, late February, early March, start advertising the classes, the week, on our website, AFTWV.org. Uh, so we will promote that and people just sign up and we take, uh, we always have a waiting list. We used to try to cap it at 100, now we're up to around 200, but uh, starting around the end of February, we'll be promoting that for summer. It's gonna be held the fourth week of June for a solid week. Uh, June the 24th through, I believe it's the 28th, something like that. The fourth week in June at Camp Dawson um, is when we hold that. Let's talk about professional development outside the normal day. I know I get a lot of discussion and concern that so many teachers' professional development is occurring during the normal school day, which interrupts instruction. And I know the state of Virginia a few years ago added 10 days or five days to their school calendar uh, for teachers for professional development. Uh, what would be your beliefs about on that concept? I think teachers would appreciate that. You know, if you expect a teacher or service personnel to go to professional development at the end of their day that they've worked, they're tired. They're, they're ready to go home to their families. They've got lessons to prepare, papers to grade, other things to do in their evening. They're all, they already are dealing with a full schedule. So we need to really provide time for them to receive professional development embedded in their workday. And I think if we can find a way to give teachers and service personnel some extra time within their school calendar to do that, they would be very appreciative. I know once upon a time I've chased this rabbit with 180 days. There doesn't seem to be any research data to support 180 days. It's just something that came arbitrarily out of the air. And I have suggested as a former legislature that perhaps we cut the instructional term back to 175 days and allow those five additional days for professional development or staff development. I think that's a great idea. You know, uh, you're, you're so right. It's quality time versus quantity. We can say any number, but it's the quality of the days that we're delivering. And if we have an opportunity to provide quality professional development for our teachers, then they're gonna pass that on to the student and it is gonna be more about quality versus quantity. I think you're exactly right, uh, Bill. I think he's onto something here. I think, uh, think so. Uh, Fred, let me ask you uh, again, uh, uh, sort of the two-pronged uh, issues related to uh, uh, recruitment and retention. Uh, obviously, we, we want to see the best and the brightest uh, 
uh, among students uh, entering, uh, you know, the great profession of, of teaching. Uh, and uh, certainly once, uh, once they make that career decision, uh, obviously we all, the public has a real vested interest in wanting to see us uh, uh, retain uh, uh, qualified, competent, uh, highly skilled teachers uh, teaching our children. Very good question, and I think one of the key components is we need to support young teachers. We need to support all teachers and all service personnel. We need to appreciate them. We need to show respect to the profession, and we hear that over and over. You know, I don't feel that what I'm doing, the long hours that I'm putting in and the dedication that I'm showing, I don't feel that it's appreciated. So we need, it's about respect. It's not just about the money. Money is important. We need to have a package that's going to attract, and, and money is a part of it, but it's also benefits. We can't make it attractive if we don't have an attractive package, and the package includes, of course, a good salary, good benefits, and respect. And I'm not sure how we go about getting the respect but it needs to be there. We need to let our teachers know that we support you. And I think many of our teachers saw that in the uh, work stoppage that we had last spring. We had community support. We had the support of our local boards of education. We had the support of our state board of education. And that meant, that equated respect for the profession. So we've got to keep that going. That momentum that we started last spring needs to keep going and it, it's about respect. That's one way that we can uh, support young teachers is respecting them. No doubt. And, uh, and again, uh, with the work stoppage, uh, you know, progress made uh, in terms of commitment to the pay raise, but uh, certainly part of the part of that dilemma uh, went to, uh, uh, you know, the, the benefit packages, uh, yes. PEIA, uh, uh, with a commitment uh, from the governor's office to impanel a, a working group to go to work on that uh, issue and problem. Uh, and I understand uh, there may be, you know, late-breaking developments uh, with respect to some of the work of the PEIA task force. Uh, could you bring us up to date uh, a little bit on uh, some progress that may be underway as it relates to uh, the commitment to uh, uh, to enhance PEIA benefits. Absolutely. Well, I was uh, privileged to attend a subcommittee meeting today. It was the plan and coverage subcommittee of the PEIA task force, and there was some promising news offered there, some motions made uh, by the committee to uh, then submit to the full task force and it's my understanding they're meeting uh, December the 10th at one o'clock at the Capitol. And then after that meeting, the governor has made uh, an announcement that he is recommending to the full task force that some of the uh, recommendations from the subcommittees be implemented, and those are all promising moves. But I, I don't want uh, anyone to mistake that what happened last spring was watched by the nation, watched actually by the world, and it started right here in West Virginia with our school employees, our public employees, both teachers and service personnel, and the whole nation and the whole world is watching to see what the long-term outcome is going to be. So some of the announcements made by the governor today are very promising. Is it the uh, absolute final word? I'm not sure, it's gonna require legislative action. But our teachers, our service personnel, and our parents, our communities are watching what's happening, and I think we're, we're encouraged. It looks very encouraging at this point. So we're hoping that the end result is going to be good news for all of us. That's great. President well, Albert and Bill, I, we're getting our signal from the engineer that perhaps we're going to have to wrap up this first session. So we'll take a break and be right back in just a few moments. This is the West Virginia Capital Report. Funding for the West Virginia Capital Report is brought to you by Mark A. Hunt and Associates and by the AFL-CIO of West Virginia. I'm Mark Hunt. And I'm Tom McGee. In my life, I've worn many hats, from being a father, a husband, to a 14-year member of the state legislature, nominee for the United States Congress, but through it all, a lawyer helping people. 
Well, Mark, I've been in uniform on the other side of the world and on television at CNN and locally. And hey, I was glad for this day. And I'm a lawyer helping people, so call us. We can help. Dan Hill Construction Company in Glen Ferris has over 33 years of local service. With county, state, and federal and church construction experience, we can design and build any type of project that will suit your needs. Once you select us for your project, we'll supply all the tools, labor, equipment, and materials to complete your project on budget and on time. We're a zero drugs tolerance company with an excellent safety record as a bonded and insured commercial contractor with an outstanding relationship and payment record reputation with all of our subcontractors and suppliers. References available upon request. We are Dan Hill Construction Company, 9033 Midland Trail, Glen Ferris, West Virginia, 304-632-1600. License number WV001196, rated in the best top 50 government contractors in West Virginia. From under the Gold Dome in Charleston, this is the West Virginia Capitol Report. Welcome back to the Capitol Report as we continue our discussion with Mr. Fred Albert, the new president of the AFT West Virginia. And uh, uh, Fred, uh, we were talking a little bit about some of the progress uh, made perhaps uh, with the work of the PEI task force. Uh, uh, just in terms of your sense of maybe some specifics uh, uh, with respect to, at least at this point, uh, commitments from the governor's office. Obviously, the legislature still has to undertake final action, but uh, if you could maybe uh, give us uh, some of the details of that. Sure, I'd be glad to. Well, from what I heard today, some of the issues, you know, the task force held 21 meetings throughout the state last spring after the, the work stoppage. The task force was created their task was not to find the funding source, but to go out and listen to the members, listen to the participants, see what their real concerns were, and then try to find a way to, to help make those differences so that it is a, a health care package that is pleasing to the employees. So one of the things that was heard throughout were the surrounding counties, if someone is living, let's say, in Mingo County, and they cannot receive health care within the state, they have to travel out of state. And if it depends upon what plan they're in, if they were in Plan A in the PEIA program, they were paying 30 percent. The, the PEIA provider was paying 70 percent. The participant was paying 30 percent. If they were in Plan B, it was a 60-40 uh, combination. The plan paid 60%, the participant paid 40%. The governor has proposed after the meeting today that in Plan A, it would be moved back to an 80-20. That's what most members would appreciate. That means the plan pays 80%, the participant pays 20%. If you're in Plan B, then it's going to move to a 70-30. That sounds very promising, that, that's good news, because in some of those border counties, they do have no choice but other than to travel out of state to get health care. So that was a real burden that uh, seemed difficult for many to bear. That is a very positive. The governor has also proposed, as he's promised, $100 million contributed to the PEIA to help defray costs and Next year in the plan, no premium increases, no copay increases, no out-of-pocket increases. Also, the drug tiers, uh, the preferred drugs that's being looked at because some drugs are more costly, we know, than others. So that's all part of this proposal that the governor has proposed, and it sounds like a good thing for the employees. That's great. Fred, I, I know as you said as you cross the state and talk to your various members and so forth from service personnel to professionals uh, that you've heard discussion around the state aid formula. Uh, I just wonder where the AFT would be relevant to the changes that the department is going to propose 
the State Board of Education is going to propose around the state aid formula, recognizing that over the last seven to 14 years, the percent of the state budget has been reduced from about 40 some percent down to 30 some percent. So around the state aid formula, what kind of changes would you like to see that would benefit the educational profession? Well, that's a very good question, Mr. Perry, and I, I appreciate what the board is doing. What I've read that the board is proposing with the school aid formula, it sounds like a positive move. It sounds like something that we could, as a union, we could get behind and support because it's going to increase the services to our students. It's going to be, that's another way that we're going to attract uh, talented, gifted teachers in our classrooms. Uh, some of the things in that uh, school aid formula are very promising and I think that's going to give us a better end result. We need to find a way where teachers are not digging into their own pockets uh, every year supplying you know, materials for our students. We need to be able to support them and that's another way we can support them with uh, finding a way to provide more resources that the teachers don't have to pay for or service personnel. I know some aides that dig into their pockets to provide for students and we shouldn't have to do that. But the school aid, the proposed school aid formula, the way I've read it from um, the newspaper, sounds like a very promising uh, program that I'm sure our union could, could support wholeheartedly. I know when you're talking about digging into their own pocket, I don't think the general public is aware of how much monies that teachers and service personnel actually put out relevant to supplies and materials. Uh, it's enormous and I think that was uh, teachers and, and service personnel, aides, secretaries, custodians, cooks, they want the best for the students in their building. We're like a family. When, when, when you go into a school that's really a caring institution, we care about that child that's there. And I mean that everyone in the building cares about them and we want to provide for them. And we do that day in and day out. But some of, the, some of the burden shouldn't have to be carried by the employees. So we're, we're looking at this uh, change in the school aid formula in a positive way, and we think that's going to be best for our students. I know that particular proposal is suggesting to increase that amount the teachers get by $100 per teacher. And that, that would be a welcomed increase. That would be a small dent, but it's a, it's a good thing and it, it would be welcomed by all teachers. Of course, the other part of that's being looked at in the formula is we know as monies have decreased, that the formula for teaching professional positions are based upon student enrollment. Right. Uh, and there's a proposal to change the ratio in that as well, which would increase the number of teachers available as student enrollment would decrease. Oh, and that is so crucial because we hear this over and over again. You know, we are asked to do more and more with less and less. And instead of decreasing uh, teachers or uh, service personnel, we need to increase that. We need more counselors. We need more health school nurses, school health nurses. We need, we don't want to cut our teachers. We want to make sure that they're there to provide the programs for our students and be there to support students in their learning. And you can't do that by cutting teachers each year or cutting service personnel. We need some stability there. You being a former teacher, I'm sure you recognize that as we cut teachers, basically we cut curriculum and programs. Absolutely. Program Absolutely. opportunity for our students. You know, as a middle school teacher, when we started uh, in my particular middle school 20 years ago, we had a uh, what we called family and consumer science teacher. We would be, back in the day, we called that home ec, but right. uh, we had uh, tech education. We have uh, course teachers, music teachers, band teachers. We need all of them. We don't need to cut them. We need to provide those programs so that we have students who are actually receiving a well-rounded curriculum. So that form of proposal will allow that to continue? I hope so, and that's, that's what we need. Uh, maybe shift gears here a little bit. Uh, in a few short weeks, uh, the legislature of the state of West Virginia is going to convene and uh, uh, be in its regular session. And uh, uh, obviously, a major part of your duties and responsibilities as president of the AFT is to advocate for the legislative interests of your your membership. Uh, and again, I assume there's a, a process you all go through in trying to establish. Uh, uh, your legislative agenda. Uh, obviously, when you're dealing with the legislature, you play offense and defense. You, yes. you don't like to see uh, 
uh, legislation that may be detrimental to the teaching profession, but if you could uh, just in general terms maybe outline for us uh, uh, some of your thoughts about the upcoming challenges of the legislative session and uh, what you intend to try to advocate for the AFT membership in West Virginia. Absolutely. Well, every year AFT has what we call a legislative summit and we held our legislative summit in September of this year and at that legislative summit we set our platform as to what we intend to go and, and advocate for uh, during the legislative session. I'm going to approach it this way. This is a fresh start. It's a fresh start for me as the newly elected president of AFT West Virginia. We have some newly elected delegates in the House of Delegates and in the Senate. Uh, so it's a, it's a fresh start for many of us and we need to keep in mind that the best economic developer in our state is a sound educational program. So I am traveling around the state right now, getting ready to leave here in a few moments to go meet with members in Wyoming County. My goal is to get out and meet with our members all across the state and let them know that we are going to the legislative session with them in mind, our students number one, our teachers, our service personnel, we're going to be there every day fighting for them to make sure that we are offering the best services that we possibly can for every student in the state of West Virginia. So whatever it takes, we're, re we're ready to go. I know teachers in the classroom, we, we'll back up here a minute and talk about benefits. And you talked about benefits and the necessity for benefits. Teacher absenteeism seems to be a concern among the public and among teachers themselves. Uh, and I think one of those is a change in legislation that occurred several years ago that perhaps we need to look back at. Uh, and that would be what, Fred? Well, that's, that's a key point. You know, uh, I'm, I'm rather old, <laughs> but I'm in the old system where my days that I could accrue uh, mean something to me because I can use those when I go to retire. I can use them to purchase health care or years of service and that does not exist now for our younger teachers. And I think they would welcome that opportunity to take um, their days that they save and carry over to use them for a benefit when they reach the age of retirement. And I, I think our legislators really need to look at that. It's a, it's a perk. Uh, it is, it keeps people in schools. We don't want people there who are sick, of course, but you know, it makes you second think, uh, think again before you take a day off, if that day could mean something to you somewhere down the road. And I think that would be a very important measure to look at. I think we're talking about there where they get one and a half days per month. Exactly. And 15 years a day accumulated. Yes. Which in that accumulation of days could be applied towards uh, increased retirement benefits. Exactly, and, and I'm in that situation. I just left the classroom and I had accrued 330 days that I did not use, and they're gonna be beneficial to me, and I think many young people, young teachers, would like to have that same opportunity. That would mean something for them. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, uh, uh, our time is, uh, is expired, but, uh, Really want to want to thank you, uh, uh, Fred Albert, for taking the time to come on to the Capitol Report and and talking to us about uh, the importance of public education in the state of West Virginia. Certainly, nothing that impacts or affects the future of our state as much as the education of our children and uh, the good hard work of our teaching professionals who get up every day, go to the classroom, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know build a stronger, better West Virginia. So uh, on behalf of uh, Dave Perry, I uh, really want to wish you every success as the newly elected president of the AFT and uh, hope you'll have an opportunity to come back on our show and talk to us a little bit uh, more about the importance of education in West Virginia. Absolutely. Well, it's been my pleasure to be with you and I look forward to that opportunity. Um, you know, I'm, I'm rolling up my sleeves, I'm ready to go, and I'm excited. I'm excited about what we can do for every student in the state of West Virginia and to build a wonderful public school system. So anything that I can ever do, I'm willing to do it.
Okay, well, great. And again, uh, that's going to do it for this week's show. And uh, I'd like to thank our viewers for tuning us in each week on the West Virginia Capitol Report. On behalf of uh, my co-host uh, Dave Perry, I'm Bill Laird. Again, thanking you all for tuning us in. Have a good week and goodbye, everybody. This is the West Virginia Capital Report. Funding for the West Virginia Capital Report is brought to you by Mark A. Hunt and Associates and by the AFL-CIO of West Virginia.